Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Richard. I'm the founder and executive director of Cinnamon Girl Incorporated. Cinnamon Girl Incorporated is an organization of leaders providing girls of color with experiences and a network of influential people that build confidence, develop her talents, and reveal her true potential to radically change the world. We are in our 17th year of teaching girls of color leadership development. We inspire girls to set rigorous goals, provide guidance and support as to what's needed to prepare for college and graduate um, and graduate school. Uh, and we also expose girls to a global mindset through international travel. And now I bring with you one of our fierce leaders, Ms. Kepra Lyons-Clark. Well, welcome everyone to Unbound, the Bay Area Book Festival's virtual conversations. Um, I'm Kepra Lyons-Clark, a rising freshman at Barnard College of Columbia, and I've been involved in the Cinnamon Girls program for the past six years. Um, I'm so excited to be your moderator for a great discussion today entitled, The Future is Ours, Restoring Democracy with Young Adult Voting Rights. Joining me is Dr. Carol Anderson, author of One Person, No Vote, How Not All Voters Are Treated Equally, Liz Rush, author of You Call This Democracy, and Jeff Fleischer, authors, author of Votes of Confidence, A Young Person's Guide to American Elections. And I myself am personally so excited for this conversation, having just turned 18 in February and having been able to vote for the first time in the March primaries. <laughs> yeah. um, and reading all your books has really made me feel so much more empowered as a young voter. Um, so to begin with, I'm just really interested in hearing an introduction from you all, who you are, um, a little bit about your book, and a little bit about why you wrote it. So we can start off with um, Dr. Anderson. You want to begin? I uh, thank you so much, Kepra. And um, I am honored and pleased to be here with all of you. I, this book emerged for me out of the 2016 election and seeing how ahistorical and wrong all of the analyses were for the most part. Um, because what got missed was the issue of voter suppression. That so I'm hearing that, you know, well, black people just didn't show up. And so that's why Hillary lost, because, you know, they just weren't filling Hillary. <laughs> and so they just, uh, you know, and so they just didn't show up. Well, this ignored that this was the first presidential election in 50 years without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to understand and unpack what does it mean when we do not protect the right to vote for millions of American citizens and what that does to our democracy? And so that's how one person, no vote, came into being. Oh. Yeah, that's awesome. Can you hear a little bit about um, Jeff and Liz? I guess I can go next. Um, so the Votes of Confidence, this is the second edition of a book that originally came out in 2016. And the goal originally in 2016 was, from my experience as a political reporter and from just talking to people over the years, trying to come up with like a, sim a relatively simple, straightforward, anecdote-based way to explain elections and government to an audience that may not have that civics education. And then obviously after 2016, like Dr. Anderson was saying, we saw a lot of very dramatic um, voter suppression, other changes to the electoral process. We had a really deeply weird election. And so I wanted to make an updated edition of the book to, that would incorporate those things as well um, beyond just the general edition. And uh, so I also probably started thinking about this book in 2016 um, and onward uh, when I noticed two things, really. One is um, a growing erosion in public trust in our government. Um, I saw a poll that said that a, a quarter of Americans rate our political system, only a quarter of Americans rate our political system as above average, and only 15% consider it the best in the world. And I think that um, a lot of us are really frustrated um, that we are not able to really address the many problems that uh, we face in our nation. Um, and I began to suspect that maybe the reason was not the problem wasn't we the people, that the problem was our democracy. So if you look at issues like the healthcare crisis, you know, like 69% of Americans support a government um, 
health plans similar to Medicare, but we can't seem to get that law passed. And that with the climate crisis, more than 60% of Americans support raising taxes on the wealthy and on corporations that uh, burn fossil fuels to combat climate change, but we can't seem to get that law passed. There's the gun crisis where more than 90% of Americans want background checks for all gun buyers. 85% want red, red flag laws to keep guns away from violent and suicidal people. And this includes 78% of gun owners, but we can't seem to get those laws passed. And then there's the police brutality crisis. Nine in 10, nine in 10 Americans support outfitting all police officers with body cameras. Eight in 10 want early warning systems that identify problematic office officers. And two thirds think that the neck restraints like the one used to kill George Floyd should be banned. And yet we can't seem to get these laws passed. And so I really wanted to kind of look at our system as it works now, look at all of the facets of it and see in what ways um, we are really failing our citizens. Uh, so I look at things like the electoral college and gerrymandering and the influence of money and voter turnout. And like Dr. Anderson, all the ways that states make it hard for people to vote. Um, and I think what I was really trying to do was kind of grab, gather in one place all the features of our elections that stand in the way of, um, of us addressing some of these problems, and then also look for ways to um, kind of offer a way out of the, the mess we're in. That's really interesting. That kind of reminded me of a quote from Jeff's book um, that he talks about in the introduction, which is that if there's one thing we know about American government is that the American people do not know a lot about it. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relevance of this quote, especially right now with, you know, lines being blurred between what's legal and illegal in government responses to the protests that are happening right now. Just general thoughts about that. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing right now is that things like police chiefs are often hired by their mayor or appointed by local officials. And I think a lot of times political coverage tends to focus on national elections mm -hmm. and not enough on state and local races. Mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing now is an impact of I feel like people will think of Minnesota as being a fairly progressive state, but the police chief who was appointed clearly does not fit that mold. Mm -hmm. And how long it's taken to first, even to get a murder charge, then to upgrade that murder charge from third degree, then to get the other officers involved charged. Like that's been a much longer process than it should be. And I think that's an impact of who those local officials are. Mm -hmm. I think there's also, um, Something that I learned actually while working on this book, and I have a master's degree in public policy, but as I was doing research, I realized how much of the, the actual workings of our democracy are affected by, by our state legislatures. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, as uh, Dr. Anderson covers incredibly beautifully in her book, a lot of the decisions about our elections and the tactics that are used to suppress the vote whether it's voter ID um, or closing polling places, but also things like, you know, whether you get automatic voter registration and whether there's a vote by mail, those are actually not decided at the federal level. They're decided at the state mm -hmm. level. And I don't ever remember in school kind of focusing on, you know, what happens at the state level and how does what happens at the state level affect your life? Um, and so I think that sometimes there's a little bit of a distortion. Everyone's kind of uh, very obsessed with, you know, the presidential race and the congressional races, and yes, those are important, but I think that we need to pay a lot more attention to the state level policy making, state level politics, and educating young people and adults about how important that level of government is to the functioning of our democracy and to the making of our laws. Absolutely, I agree. One of the, the things that strikes me, like even in this moment, um, when we were going through the primaries um, and, and they were still undecided, was this sense was, if I couldn't get my presidential candidate, then I wasn't going to be bothered. Mm -hmm. And people were saying, you know, presidencies are important, but if you're not going to vote for the president, show up at the polls because what's happening down ballot is mm -hmm. absolutely essential to the way you're able to live your life. What happens in the school board? has a lot to do with the way that our public schools function and don't function. 
what these legislators do in terms of figuring out, particularly with this um, upcoming um, in 2020, with the upcoming drawing of the districts after the census, um, that's going to map out what our congressional representation will look like. Oh my gosh, <laughs> you, you can either have folks sitting there at the table like we had in Wisconsin in 2011 after the 2010 election, and they're sitting up there almost, almost like, <laughs> right? just, just like evil villainish, where they lock themselves in a room for, for almost four months to sit there with this high powered mapping software and this like the Cambridge analytic data with these two goals, which were both about how do we undermine democracy and maintain the power in our hands, despite what the people want. Or you could have a legislature that is like, yeah, we love democracy. And we are going to be responsive to the people and the people's needs and what they need. And we're going to listen and then we're going to respond. And so you can see two different types of governments happening there and they affect how we live our lives. They affect our access to health care. So you'll have states that have expanded Medicaid so that people can get access to the Affordable Care Act. And you'll have states like I'm in Georgia. And they're like, over my, no, basically over your dead body. <laughs> so that who our legislators are, who our mayors are, who our, our, our zoning board commissioners are, our county commissioners are, they affect our lives. Who our judges, who our DAs are, mm -hmm. they affect our lives. And so it is about a full, vibrant democracy requires full participation. Kind of following up on that idea, Dr. Anderson, um, there are also uh, measures on ballots that can either be pro-democracy or against democracy, right? Like in my state of Oregon, people are gathering signatures to you know, put forward an anti-gerrymandering bill and also another one to limit um, uh, campaign contributions from corporations. And oh. so, you know, being really interested in also what your state, if there are measures on the ballot, you know, we've made some progress in places like Michigan with gerrymandering and some other places. So we can actually also make changes by looking at some of the ballot measures too. So, so think about, for instance, um, in Florida with felony disfranchisement, <laughs> Right. So felony disfranchisement. You know, we've heard um, particularly we've become much more aware with Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow mm -hmm. about mass incarceration. Well, Florida implemented basically its version of mass incarceration early um, in 1868. It passed a law saying that those who had been convicted of a felony could not vote permanently. Well, by the time we rolled around to the 21st century, <laughs> um, there were over 6 million Americans who could not vote because of a felony conviction, and 1.7 million of them were in Florida alone. And the people went, e dog gone enough already. And it was that ballot initiative, Amendment 4, that regained the voting rights, the civic rights, ended the civic death of 1.4 million Floridians. That's important. That's, that's, that's the power of democracy. And you saw that legislature then come back going, oh, we gotta stop this thing. I mean, they had their Scooby-Doo moment. Aurora, Shady. <laughs> yeah, right now. So they're trying to, to say, well, you have to also have all your fines paid, which really seems to me to be the equivalent of a, of a poll tax, right? It it's turning back to, okay, well, now you have to pay money in order to, to restore your right to vote. Yeah. I think one thing is when you talk about Florida specifically, also in the 2000 election, the Bush versus Gore election, where Florida was the swing vote that decided the election. Part of the issue there was that so many alleged felons had been purged from the rolls. They were also purging people who had names similar to felons. Um, they cast this very wide net in terms of who they took the voting rights away from. And they saw that there was an impact there and that it potentially swung the presidential election. Yes. So for people who wanted to suppress the vote, 
they now saw this as a successful strategy. And we've been seeing more and more of it ever since. Yes. I read that chapter quite clearly. Um, and one person no vote about the, the Al Gore election. Very. <laughs> it, 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 it changed the course of history in this nation. Um, and it really laid out the blueprint for voter suppression mm. because part of what it showed was that one, if you can put the right person in power who's controlling the levers of the electoral process, the secretary of state. So these are, are these kind of down ballot uh, positions that we don't pay a lot of attention to absolutely essential. You put the right person in power, they can disrupt and destroy the access to the ballot box for your citizens. And so demographics don't matter. The Secretary of State can help change the demographic of the electorate. Mm -hmm. Wow. And In Georgia especially, you saw that last time around. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Cheat and lie. Cheat and lie. Cheat and lie. So it's almost like a really bad law firm. Cheat and lie. <laughs> um, and that's what you saw really happening there in Florida. The, the, and the role of the U.S. Supreme Court in stopping that recount when it became very clear that w, George W. Bush was in trouble and may not win Florida, so therefore may not win the Electoral College and therefore may not win the presidency, the U.S. Supreme Court ran in there um, and just blocked the will of the voters. It, it, it set a horrible tone and a pattern that we are living with today. So, yeah, and the issue of voting machines, <laughs> um, the, the issue of having intimidation, so having police at the, like the checkpoint Charlies of the routes coming into the voting um, precincts in the black community knowing good and doggone well that African-Americans do not have a good relationship with law enforcement. So when you put police at the only road in and out of a voting, a voting polling station, you are systematically blocking the access to the ballot box. This is what was laying out. And so I know one of the things that we've got to deal with in this election that we didn't have to then is that the consent decree that the Republican Party had on stopping these kinds of voter intimidation poll watchers has now been lifted. And so they're like, okay, what was the sound? <laughs> 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 Yeah, and I'm, I've been hearing right now we have people in positions of power like Mr. Trump um, breathe and the, the rhetoric around voter fraud is resurfacing. I've seen some tweets about it on, on his side, and that's a phrase that um, I think you all discuss in your book a lot. So um, I'm just wondering, like, during what's happening right now politically um, with the protests and the pandemic, what you guys feel the importance of your book is, and then more generally kind of your thoughts on how democracy can work in conjunction with um, with these kind of ground level demonstrations that are happening um, and how that kind of pushes legislation. What, if you guys had any <laughs> thoughts about that kind of a <laughs> Jeff. I mean, as far as the coronavirus, it really underscores the need for being able to vote by mail. Mm -hmm. Because right now you're putting people in a position where if they have to go to a polling place, it's potentially putting their health at risk. Mm -hmm. And so Donald Trump did a thing recently where he basically said the quiet part out loud and insisted that if we have um, vote by mail, it will allow more people to vote and that that would be bad for him. And his exact quote was that no Republican would ever be elected again, which isn't true. But what happened is the Republican Party would have to moderate his positions in a way to attract more voters, not that they would never win again. They would not nominate a candidate like Donald Trump again if that were the case. But they would, there would still be a two-party system. That's not a true argument on his part.
Um, yeah, I have friends who live in Wisconsin, and I was just horrified to see that so many citizens there had to wait in lines, trying to socially distance with their masks on just so that they could have a say. You know, citizens should not have to choose between voting and their health. Um, you know, I live in, a, in Oregon, which has had vote by mail since 2000. And, um, you know, it's I, I think maybe people who, who aren't familiar with it may be kind of scared of it, of it. But it's so it makes so much sense when you do it. The ballot shows up in your mailbox. You open it, you get a voter pamphlet. You can at any time, any place, you know, sit down and work on it, look on the Internet to learn more about the candidates and about the issues. You fill it out on your own time. You don't have to show an ID. You don't have to wait online. You don't have you know, plenty of early voting. And then you, you know, you stick it in an envelope and you sign the, um, the, uh, the signature and seal it. You can either drop it in the mail or drop it in a ballot box. And I think it's really a much more, it's, it's becoming uh, more of interest now, but I, I think that it's a, a much healthier way to vote, not just because of the coronavirus, because I, I think it also really respects um, citizens and respects that, you know, we're working, we're caring for people in our family. We are, um, um, you know, we're busy and some people have less mobility and it just really is a much more fair way to vote across the board. The other thing is it uh, does an amazing job with do voter turnout. When Oregon moved to vote by mail, we have about an 80% voter turnout in presidential elections. And that's compared to less than half in, in, in the United States. And so it's one of these things that's just a kind of a no brainer. Like we should just have vote by mail should just be widespread. It should just be the way elections are run. Um, and the voter fraud stuff is just, if you look at any of the research, it shows that voter fraud is basically non-existent. Um, here in Oregon, I have a funny story. My husband was working on, in a truck and he fell backwards off the truck and broke both of his wrists. And so his signature on the ballot was odd. And it was actually flagged by Oregon election officials who, you know, reached out and said this, signature doesn't match. Can you confirm this is actually your vote? So we'll count it. So, you know, we can see that that there's an easy way to check. Um, and honestly, voter fraud is a felony and nobody really has any kind of incentive to cheat on a vote by mail ballot. So all that talk of voter fraud is just a distraction. I think, uh, Dr. Anderson, you said so beautifully in your book, you talk about how you know, they hide behind these sort of common sense ideas. Like, of course, you want secure elections. Yes, we do want secure elections. <laughs> but voter fraud doesn't happen. And there are lots of ways to have secure elections without barring people and putting up barriers and making it difficult for our own citizens to vote. Right. And, you know, and so one of the things here, because I'm in Georgia, the anti-Oregon. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, so one of the things is the coronavirus has just ripped through Georgia mm -hmm. and it, it, it actually pushed back the primary for 2020. And there was this, this discussion about, okay, so we're going to have to send out um, um, absentee, not even absentee ballots, uh, applications for absentee ballots to every registered voter. And the Speaker of the House, he was, he was doing a, a, tele, a radio show kind of deal. And he was like, have you ever heard of anything so outrageous? This is, this is going to be devastating for the Republicans. Every registered voter getting an absentee ballot? Now, now think about that statement. You know, mm -hmm. so it didn't say every human being in the planet would get an absentee ballot. No, it said every registered voter. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with every registered voter getting an absentee ballot? And that then speaks to the fear of what a real voter turnout will do. Mm -hmm. And that's why you then get 
this language of voter fraud because what it's designed to do is to scare the American public into co-signing and acquiescing to a series of voter suppression techniques that are targeted at groups that will not, generally do not vote for the Republicans. So the, and, and the issue of, is this a bipartisan thing? It is in terms of when you talk to people, what we're talking about is we want everybody to vote. So this isn't about trying to stop independents from voting. This isn't about trying to stop Republicans from voting. This vibrant democracy requires that we vote and that we hold our elected officials accountable. When that doesn't happen, when you get things like the extreme partisan gerrymandering that happened in Wisconsin, and that leads to what Liz has talked about in terms of the bulk of the American people want hmm, AR-15s, it's, off of the, out of the hands of civilians. This is in the land of duh, but why haven't we seen, uh, I, that land of duh is a really amazing place. Um, so, we live in the land of duh, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> so why haven't we seen the kind of movement in the political realm for what the people are demanding? And that is because you have this, this, this system that has been put in place that short circuits American democracy. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot, I think, to do then with why you're seeing people out in the streets now. Mm -hmm. Why you're seeing the depth of the protest in 50 states. And why when the current regime pushes back with violence. Why you see um, the violence that is raining down as, as the militarized police go after nonviolent protesters. All that does is it makes the people more determined to fight for this democracy. When I saw the lines in Wisconsin, once you had the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court rule that you had to have your absentee ballot postmarked by the 7th. And this was a ruling on the 6th. <laughs> How am I doing so far? That you had to have it postmarked by the 7th in order to be able to have your vote count. Except there were so many people because of the coronavirus who hadn't received their absentee ballots yet because the request had been so much for the state. So you were asking people then to either choose not to vote or to choose not to put themselves before a coronavirus firing squad. I mean, we just need to have nationwide vote by mail. You, you're, you're automatically opted in if you're registered, you can always go and say you don't want it, but you should be opted in so that you have that chance. The other thing that I think we need to add is, uh, is automatic voter registration. We're one of the only countries in the world, democracies in the world, that doesn't automatically register people to vote. So in this country, there are 50 million people who are not registered to vote. So they're just like not even part of they're not able to express their voice in, in any way. And in this country, what we seem to do is we seem to put, let, let's put a hoop up, let's put a jump up, let's make you have to register to vote, and then we'll make you have to go to a polling place on election day and da 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 da. Well, why don't we just register everybody? The government already has information about all of us. Everyone's registered, ballots show up at your home, and we can really then hear what do the people want? What do the people want? The polls tell us what the people want. How about the, the voting actually reflects that and the representatives that we elect actually know that and actually start working toward the things that we know we want in this country? 
Well, that's right. Yeah. I think I think Dr. Anderson, you're like the country of duh. <laughs> I think it's just what this is all about. I mean, all this is such common sense. And I I think that, you know, when you talk about when you're talking about whether this is a partisan issue or not a partisan issue, I think there are some aspects that are, but I also think that a lot of Americans agree with a basic principle that everyone should have an equal say and that voting should be free and equal and accessible. Like those are things we can all agree on. And if there's something we can all agree on, let's just make it happen. I would add to that too, that the idea of automatically registering everybody. So when we talk about polls, polls always include either likely voters or registered voters. Mm -hmm. And so people who haven't been registered aren't even hearing their opinions voiced in polling. And a lot of people make decisions based on polling, whether they're politicians trying to decide their position on a policy or whether they're the general public deciding whether it's worth casting a vote in a particular race based on whether or not they think that race is gonna be competitive. So there's a whole cycle that happens here too. And I think one of the things that we've got to, <laughs> to, to factor in that makes the US the US is racism. Mm -hmm. what the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow have done to the election systems in the United States. Um, it has been absolutely toxic and destructive. Um, one of the things that I, 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 I laid out was the myth in the book was the Mississippi plan of 1890, where uh, Mississippi legislature is seeing all of these black folks in Mississippi organizing to vote and voting and bringing in some folk that they're like, whoa, whoa. And so they're like, how do we stop black folk from voting without writing a law saying we don't want black people to vote? Because we now have this thing called the 15th Amendment <laughs> that says you can't stop black people from voting just because they're black. And Mississippi said, oh, we got this. And they came up with this plan to use the societally imposed conditions on black people and make those conditions the access to the ballot box. Issues like poverty, issues like literacy. When you have centuries of slavery, poverty is real. When you have centuries of denying people the access to education, illiteracy is real. And then when you make those the means to, in order to be able to vote, you have effectively wiped out the majority of a population who are citizens. And that's what we're seeing now is the replication in terms of voter ID, um, in terms of purges, in terms of where the polls are and where they aren't. And so part of what is blocking our true commitment to democracy is racism. Mm -hmm. That is one of, that is that, that, that silent beast that is sitting there in the middle of America, destroying what America could be. And we've got to face it and we've got to eradicate it. Yeah, Dr. Anderson, reading your book, you really laid out chronologically, like from, um, you know, the abolition of slavery with the inaction of the VRA, just like how, how everything has kind of led up from there. Um, and since the, you know, the beginning of our democracy, it seems like the, our democracy has been try, has been fought against um, in a weird way. And I think all your guys' books really, really brought that to light for me, the ways in which it just seems like we've never really had a true democracy. So it's kind of hard to imagine um, what that would look like. Um, do you guys have any ideas, Liz? Do you have any, like, what would, how would things, like, be really different if, <laughs> if, if we had a real democracy in which... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> How would things be different? Okay, well, let's just start with the Electoral College, right? Oh. So basically, we've set up this system where, you know, there's like maybe six swing states that everybody pays attention to, and then no one else's vote really matters. There's really sort of no incentive to even engage. And, um, you know, because of the Electoral College, you know, five times there have been presidents who have been elected um, without the popular vote. And this has huge implications. I saw when I was reading Dr. Anderson's book, I made a connection that I hadn't made when I was writing my book. But um, because of the Electoral College system, not a four out of nine of the U.S. Supreme Court justices were nominated by presidents who lost 
the national popular vote. So she has, she does a, uh, you do a wonderful job of um, talking about the court cases and how there could be progress and progress and progress. And then the Supreme Court can come down and go boom and just end the progress. Well, you know, some of that, it, it's hard to kind of see how all these dots connect, but the Electoral College allows people who have not won the popular vote to take office. Those people appoint, appoint the Supreme Court justices, and then that affects the whole, um, yeah. uh, you know, Supreme Court uh, aspect of things. So, you know, moving to, for sure, moving to a national popular vote, a lot of people kind of throw up their hands and say, well, it's, you know, written into the Constitution, we can't do it. Well, there's already a, a really effective movement afoot um, for states to join an interstate compact. So basically the state agrees that all of, of their electors will go to whoever wins the national popular vote. Um, Oregon, my state has already passed this compact as have like 15 or 16 other states. And so as soon as we have enough for uh, 270 electors for the states representing 270 electors, it, it can it can go into um, into being. And then we can actually have a president, hello, <laughs> elected like we handle every other election where the people go out and say who we want to be president, who we want to be um, the vice president. You know, I, I agree with uh, with you, Dr. Anderson, about, you know, ending gerrymandering. And um, I think that, um, you know, automatic voter registration and vote by mail, that those would do a, would 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 really take a chunk out of voter suppression tactics. I think that might be one way to tackle some of those. The other thing that we need to really look at is the role of money in policy policymaking. Um, uh, wealthy people and corporations have an oversized say in our government and in our policies. And um, again, these can kind of link back to the Supreme Court, which links back to the Electoral College. So they're all kind of interconnected. But again, I think that there are ways that we can start to limit the influence of money in our elections and in our in our policy making. I also strongly believe that it's time for a youth vote for 16 and 17 year olds to have the right to vote. Um, you know, there are eight million citizens in that category. Two million, two million of them work in jobs and they pay an average of $700 million in taxes. So we already have sort of taxation without representation. Many of them are caretakers for sick family members. Many of them take on parenting roles, caring for siblings. They can drive, they can marry. Many of them are tried as adults in court and they have, they are these huge forces in our world already and yet we don't let them have a say in how um, our government runs. Um, I, that was one of the most fun chapters that I, um, that I wrote for this book. I just learned so much and, and, and also my, my admiration for young people um, really grew in writing that chapter. And I became just really convinced that um, that they deserve the right to vote and that that would really be good for our democracy, too, because we have 18 is this kind of terrible time to have people start voting. Um, a lot of them are launching their lives either in college or they're moving if they're in an apartment. And so, you know, 18 to 25 year olds have very low voter turnout because they're not part of a community of voters, whereas 16 and 17 year olds, you know, can be voting with their schools and their family and create a habit of voting that can then continue um, for a long time and really help with kind of our voter turnout problem too. So that's just a short, I have other ideas <laughs> of things we can do, but those are some of the highlights. That, and, and honestly, I think a lot of these things can be done more easily than we think and that there are people already working on them and having success implementing them. Yeah, I know in recent years, there's been an increase in the amount of young voter turnout, like from ages 18 to, to 24. So, yeah, why? Uh, maybe this question can be directed towards Jeff. Why, why do you think that is in recent years? I know it's been like an upwards trend. Hopefully it continues that way. Well, it's also a thing that is also facing voter suppression, too. 
is that there's a lot of attempts to prevent young people from voting. So in Wisconsin and in West in 2016, one of the ways that voter suppression happened was trying to make sure that students couldn't use their student IDs as a valid ID to vote with. Mm. So that they were stuck either voting in their home state when they, you know, live at college. That's the place where local laws are actually going to affect them. And they were disenfranchised that way too. And we started to see that around the country as well. Um, but I think that angers people. I think that gets them to turn out. I think in general, young voters now have access to more information than they did even a generation ago. And they also have access to more disinformation. That's its own problem. Um, but because they have access to the internet and social media, even if they live in the most remote place possible, where before they may not have had a local news channel or a newspaper delivered every day, they now have access to that information in more places, though there are still places that are not online. Um, so I think that's one reason that's driving youth vote. I think also the outcomes of elections are driving youth vote. I mean, we had a, very, a relatively low turnout in 2016. To this day, the two highest vote totals by any presidential candidate are both by President Obama in 2008 and 2012. So not only did Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump by 3 million votes in 2016, but she also did not come close to President Obama's two totals. And some of that's voter suppression, some of it's just lack of enthusiasm and people turning out. Um, so I think people have seen there's an impact when people don't show up to vote. Yeah. And yeah. that drove very good youth turnout in 2018. Yes. It went yes. up dramatically. And, and so I think part of what we're seeing now is because we had such a great turnout in 2018, um, that youth vote shot up. It went, <sighs> um, and we had a voter turnout, the highest voter turnout in a midterm since 1914. Wow. <laughs> um, and so the response has been, <laughs> how do we stop this? Now, I, I know that sounds like or like or, or, <laughs> where, where what we should be doing is going, oh, it's so good. But instead, we're like, whoa. And so how do we stop this? And, and so you're seeing things like in Texas right now, in the midst of the coronavirus, is that the Texas Attorney General and mm -hmm. then the Texas Supreme Court have ruled that when it comes to absentee ballots, that the coronavirus is not a legitimate excuse to want and ask for a absentee ballot. Only those who are 65 and older can get a no excuse absentee ballot. Yeah. Or you think about how um, in the 2018 midterm, in Texas, I swear I'm not picking on Texas, <laughs> but in Texas, um, at uh, Prairie View A&M, an historically black college in Prairie View, Texas, is that for early voting, what they did with early voting, the town fathers gave 11 days of early voting to surrounding areas of Prairie View. Mm -hmm. Prairie View got three days, and two of those days, the machines weren't on campus. Yep. Uh, or you take, you and, 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 and there's a reason for all of this, or you take um, North Carolina, and North Carolina A&T, the largest historically black college in the nation, what North Carolina's legislature did as it was drawing its gerrymandered maps, because you've got a large, powerful, engaged student body there. So North Carolina drew a line, a congressional line, straight down and split that campus in two. So one side of the campus is in one congressional district and the other side of the campus is in another congressional district. It's how do we stop the youth vote? And this is because in that, I uh, thank you, Jeff, in that 2008 presidential election, Obama's ground game brought 15 million new voters to the polls. They were 15 million. I mean, that's like, Dang, and that overwhelmingly African-American, Hispanic, Asian-American, the poor, and the young. 
when you think about, and this becomes the hit list for voter suppression. So all of these methods that we talk about, voter ID, poll closures, gerrymandering, um, all of the voter roll purges, all of those are designed to take out one or more on that. And, and as you can hear, the youth vote is a key critical component of that. Mm-hmm. And, and this is why the engagement of youth with voting is so important because you are to be feared. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> because you have these visions about the environment. You have these visions about your safety, real safety. You have these visions about access to health care. You have these visions about access to quality education. And when that voice is put into the electoral process, fierce. <laughs> and that is why. Yeah, I oh, mean, hit list. yeah. <laughs> I mean, all of you and your books are really, really helping out with that. Like the ability of you guys to take complex, like the government, the governmental system in the U S is very confusing. And I think on purpose, but um, you guys all have the special ability of putting it into language that is very easy to read and to understand, um, especially for like a young person like me who maybe isn't too familiar with um, scholar scholarship work. So I'm wondering about the research process that you guys went through, and maybe Jeff can answer this. Um, like, what was that like in terms of gathering all this information and um, transforming it into something that's really easily accessible to young people? So for me, I kind of had a loose idea in my head for years about pitching this book even before I did. Mm. And so a lot of it was just from working as a political reporter for a long time. I'm having interviewed a lot of people related to politics, either politicians, experts, um, professors, people like that. Um, But when I first pitched it, the idea was to kind of come up with topic areas and then kind of verify trends I thought I was seeing, um, specific examples. And I wanted to use a lot of anecdotes so that it's not just, here's this law and here's how this law works. But I wanted to use an example of, here's how this played out in real life. So, for example, I use uh, push polling, which is a practice that doesn't go back all that far. But if I explain what it is, it's kind of a boring concept. So I explained an example of when this was used against John McCain in the Republican presidential primary mm-hmm. and try to use that as to, oh, an illustrative example. So now that would register with people in a way that just the term wouldn't. Mm-hmm. And I tried to do that as much as possible because that's how people learn. Yeah. Yeah, Liz, what was your research process like? Yeah, uh, this book was actually quite different from a lot of other books that I've written. Um, I also have a background um, in journalism, and um, I often will tackle a book by finding, um, the, you know, people whose stories I can tell that can kind of bring you, you know, bring the material to life through through people, and. Um, and by actually finding those people and interviewing them, you know, or spending time with them, especially scientists, I do a lot of scientists in the field where I'm, you know, bringing science to life. With this book, there were so many issues and so much that I needed to put in that I, I actually had to take a little bit more of a scholarly approach. Not, um, I don't have a PhD and I'm, I'm you know, not as, as uh, scholarly as, as you, Dr. Anderson, but but what I was really trying to do was survey um, for the the topics that I I thought um, needed to be addressed, like finding out, um, you know, looking at the research on those areas, looking for polling data, looking for, as Jeff said, also looking for stories and anecdotes that would help kind of bring things to life. So it was actually a, a different process for me, less. Um, kind of interviewing and um, telling, having like sort of one person or five people whose stories I use kind of as a donkey to carry you through the issue and more, a little bit more as a, a, not exactly scholarly, but more of a review of really, I'm indebted to the journalists and the researchers and the pollsters. And I use Dr. Anderson's book into, you know, the scholars who have been studying these issues. And so I think what I was trying to bring to it is how do I pull all this together in a way that you see that 
um, that, that these are, are intertwined and that, you know, each one of them is little and subtle, but when you bring them all together, then you see how much impact they have on the way our government runs and, um, and the problems that we have and also kind of looking at some of the ways out of the mess that we're in. And, and for me, this was different than my previous two books, that which were heavily Scott. So I'm in the archives uh, for years. Um, this one, I felt the fierce urgency of now, in the words of Martin Luther King. Um, I felt like we were on a precipice as a nation. And one of my talents is to be able to make policy legible. And, and that's what I set out to do in this book. And I am so thankful for the journalist. Oh my gosh, what Ari Berman did. Oh my gosh. And, and, the, the, to, and to, to bring out the stories here and there. And, and also I grew up in the church and I got to tell you, I cannot quote chapter and verse like my daddy could because daddy was a deacon. <laughs> but what I remember were the power of the stories and that those stories then took you into the moral crisis or the moral of the story itself. And so what I set out to do in this book is to find the data. That was my research piece but to also find the stories, to humanize this. So it wasn't just about, oh, Shelby County v. Holder. And it wasn't just about, you know, v. And it just wasn't about this, this, this. But what it was about was the impact that this has on our lives. The impact that this has on the way that we're able to raise our children. The impact that this has on how we're able to go to school, where we're able to live, what kind of health care we're able to give, get, get what kind of air we're able to breathe, whether we're going to have access to clean drinking water, whether my baby's going to go off to war. Mm -hmm. When we understand the power of the policies in shaping our lives, then that's also why in, that, in the book I have the chapter, The Resistance. Because it looks like you're looking at a Leviathan. I mean, it looks like you're looking at a thing that, I, jeez, I can't take this thing down. And it's like, baby boy, you don't know my name. Mm. And watching those folks mobilize in Alabama because they were like, there will not be a Senator Roy Moore of Alabama even though Alabama had applied every method of voter suppression against that black population. They just came out there. I mean, this was like Clark Kent taking off the glasses and, oh, the cape was coming on and everything. And, and, you know, and you think about that. It was grassroots mobilization asking people, what do you want in your life? And then figuring out these civil organizations, figuring out what are the stumbling blocks? What are these voting suppression methods? And how do we get around them? How do we get over them? How do we barrel through them? How do we move them out the way? Mm. Ooh. And so in Alabama in December 2017, Jeff um, no, um, Miller, I forget his name now. Um, well, Doug Miller. Uh, Merrill, Merrill, the, the Secretary of State. Uh -huh. Yeah, he thought that the um, voter turnout rate was only going to be about 25%. It was 40%. Wow. In the Black Belt counties, 45%. Five percentage points higher. Baby boy, you don't know my name. Mm. That's the power of the people in seizing democracy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And your, your book did a great job of really giving like I felt empowered reading it all of you guys is um, so much more knowledgeable about about me and more about myself as a young voter and more secure in myself and my power as a young voter yes. um, but it does look like we're running out of time so I just want to thank Unbound for hosting this book talk um, and thank you all so so much for having taking the time out to speak with me today 
Um, and before we close, I just wanted to ask if you guys had any advice for young people right now, young voters during this uh, specific political climate where so many things are going on. It really feels like um, like a young adult apocalyptic novel <laughs> right now. <laughs> if you guys had any advice, um, <laughs> any words of inspiration for young people, you can start with Jeff. I would say from a voting perspective, if you're not registered, register now. Do it as soon as you can and check it regularly because there are still going to be attempts to purge people off the rolls. There's still going to be ways to try to block, especially young people from voting. So make sure you check and verify that several times between now and election day. So that when election day comes around, your vote hasn't been taken away from you. And I think one of the, the key things too is to really, yes, definitely register, but also to organize. To, to find those organizations that are also working to expand democracy. Getting that kind of civic engagement helps in steeping you into what's at stake and why we fight. Mm. Um, and that can be um, things like um, when they have shut down the polls, being able to drive people to and from the polling stations ways to circumvent, get around, and move those stumbling blocks. That is the power of the youth vote. Knowing who you are, what you're voting for, why you're voting for it, and why you are engaged. Yes. So it is that organizing that is absolutely essential. I love that. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I agree with Jeff and with Dr. Anderson, both on registering, signing up for an absentee ballot, um, joining organizations. You know, there are organizations like Represent Us and the League of Women Voters and the NAACP and Common Cause. You know, there are lots of groups that are already doing this work and, and are so eager to have your, your help. The other um, thing that I would add is that um, you have right now representatives whose job it is to represent you. Um, I would suggest that you put in your phone, in your contacts, your five representatives. So your two U.S. senators, your one member of Congress, and your two state reps. They, their job is to represent you. And I actually believe that the youth vo voice has more power, that if you um, either you know, call or email or, or text, um, if you get a group of young people together and actually go to their offices and meet with them and tell them what you care about and tell them what you want, that that can have a huge impact. I mean, the, the the positive part of this is that we do live in a democracy where someone is, it's their job to represent you. And I would encourage young people to use that power. I think that, that um, young people are uniquely um, positioned that, that, you know, you think about like what happened um, in Parkland, Florida, when young people speak with a strong voice about something, people pay attention. And I think that you can harness that voice um, right through voting, through um, through working through these organizations, but also going directly to your representatives and speaking your mind there as well. I believe strongly in the power of young people to make change. I think that's something that we were all, we're all trying to do with our books. And we just really wanna give you everything that you need to do to do this important work. I'm, I'm sorry that you have to do it. <laughs> you shouldn't have to do it, but we wanna help you um, by giving you whatever resources and, and understandings that can help you do that important work. And I also just wanna thank all the young people who are already yes. um, doing such incredible work to make change. Um, you are such an inspiration to me. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank all of you. Thanks to Carol Anderson, Liz Rush, and Jeff Fleischer for joining us today. Um, at the end of this talk, there will be a link to where you can buy the books that we have discussed in the panel and have them shipped directly to you. Um, thanks again for you guys' time. This has been such an amazing conversation. I feel empowered to make change. I'm definitely um, putting my <laughs> representative's contacts in my phone right away after we end this. Um, but, I'm Cinnamon Girl Kepper Lance Clark, and you've been watching Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.